Good morning, friends. I hope you are doing well and are excited to talk about covenant. Woo! My name is Thomas, if we haven't met yet, and it's my joy to be on staff here at the Erie campus and be able to open up the scriptures on the weekends with us. And we're going to continue in our series through the book of Hebrews, looking at the exaltation of Jesus, that Jesus is greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Abraham, greater than Melchizedek, greater than the priesthood, that Jesus is the great son of God himself, who has come and mediated a better covenant. Now, what comes to your mind when you hear the word covenant? Commitment. Commitment. Marriage. Who said marriage? Over here, 10,000 bonus points over here. Commitment, marriage. What else? Contract. Unbreakable. You guys didn't say prenuptials. You know, it's like, that's good. That's good. But this is it. You're making a commitment. You're making a vow. You're bringing relationships into a different form. You're bringing people together that weren't previously united. That's a covenant. It's unbreakable. The question is, what happens when someone breaks their vows? How does the relationship then be preserved? That's the covenant. And Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant between us and God. And so grab Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to talk about this covenant because Jesus gave us these words that are probably so easy to say, and we just forget the theological integrity behind them. On the night that he was betrayed, he was with his disciples. And he takes bread from the table And he breaks it. And he says, this is my body given to you. Do in remembrance of me. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took a cup of wine. And he says, this is the new covenant that's established in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. And we say that, this is the new covenant. But what is the new covenant? What does it do? Why is it better? So Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Are you guys guys all with me today? I mean, it's not even daylight savings. Like that's next week. You have an excuse next week. Today is today. I don't even know why we do daylight savings. But anyway, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. I, I mean, I love an author who's just going to tell you why we've been talking about something. Like you don't have to figure it out. Just, okay, for the last seven chapters, talking about how great Christ is, particularly in the last chapter about how he's in the line of Melchizedek. That's kind of confusing. The reason we mentioned any of this, the point is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. The point is all this, that Jesus is the great high priest. Remember, the priest is the mediator of a covenant, the one who represents us before God. That Jesus, this great high priest, sits in a place of honor, of majesty. No one's greater than Jesus. But he occupies that place so that he can have an active ministry, that he is a minister at the right hand of God. It's not just something he did in the past or something he's going to do in the future, that he has a present active ministry for us today. Like, what is Jesus doing for us today? He's in this place to minister to us. And and how does he minister to us? Verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Now, Jesus is the perfect mediator, the one who reaches the terms of agreements between us and God. Remember, a priest operates as a representative of of human beings to God. Priests represent human beings to God. Kings, 
their office represents God to human beings. And Jesus holds both offices, as we've looked at. He is the priestly king, the king of righteousness, the prince of peace. He's the one that both represents God to us. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. He is fully God, the son of God. And yet he has become incarnate. He took on flesh so that he could be the new Adam, so that he could represent humanity to God. So he's the perfect mediator, the king priest, God to man, man to God. And his covenant is enacted on better promises. What Jesus promises in his covenant, the covenant of his blood, is better than the old covenant. Now, for us to understand that, we should probably look at the old covenant for a little bit, don't you think? So you guys guys up for like a Bible scavenger hunt on the covenant? Yes, let's do it. Open up the very first pages of your Bible to Genesis chapter 9. Even if you didn't want to go, I was going, okay? Even if you didn't want to, I was I was committed. If you don't know, this book is built on covenant. There are several covenants in the Old Testament that God makes with people. It's like the backbone in which God hangs his promises on what he says he'll be faithful to do. One of the first ones I want you to notice is the one he makes with Noah. Think of Noah, Noah in the ark. The people were wicked and unrighteous. And God says, I'm, I've just grown weary of all their wrongdoing. Look how they hurt each other, divide each other, murder and kill each other. I'm done. Yet there's this righteous family, Noah and his wife and his kids and, and their wives. And I'm going to preserve humanity through this family. And so he brings them into an ark and he preserves creation through this ark. And after the flood, he makes this covenant. Chapter 9, verse 7. Sorry, verse eight. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall I, sorry, shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, this rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It's a beautiful picture. That God makes an everlasting permanent covenant with the offspring of Noah. Now raise your hand if you've done the ancestry.com and found out that Noah was your great, great, great ancestor. <laughs> Everyone should be raising their hand. That God has an eternal, everlasting covenant with humanity. That he will never again look upon the wickedness of humanity and say, I'm just done with them and wash them all away in a flood. And as a sign of this covenant, he puts a rainbow in the sky. So every time you see a rainbow, you should just think of the goodness and kindness of God towards wicked, evil men and women like me. You should just see this. Wherever you see a rainbow, you say, man, look at God, how he has preserved us, that he suffers with us, that he's not done with us yet, that he will preserve humanity and promises to bring a redeemer, one who will rescue us. It's a beautiful picture. Now, this everlasting covenant, is it conditional or unconditional? It's, condi- it's, it's unconditional. Noah doesn't have to do anything. Like, no, if you do this and your offspring do this, then, you know, I'll continue to hold back the flood waters. No, it's just this unconditional goodness and the patience and steadfastness of God. Now, from the offspring of Noah comes a man named Abram. We've looked at Abram through the book of Hebrews. This is Father Abraham, has many sons and daughters, and they create a family. And God makes another covenant with Abraham. So flip in your Bible just a couple pages over to Genesis chapter 17. God's already called Abram and told him what he's going to do with him and through his offspring, through him and Sarah. And here he establishes this covenant with Abram. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. 
walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said, and behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. So he makes a covenant with Abraham. He's gonna bless Abraham so that all the peoples of the earth, every nationality, tribe, is gonna be blessed through Abraham's family. It's a beautiful covenant. The sign of this covenant, do you guys know what it is? Is circumcision. So this is a marking of God's covenant with his people. Now, is this covenant conditional or unconditional? It's conditional. Raise your hand if you think it's conditional. All right, come on. Be committed, be committed. No, no independent voters in here, all right? Unconditional? Conditional. Who says conditional? All right. Here's the good news. You're both right. All right, so it's both. It's that it's conditional. Like, Abram, come to the land that you didn't live, right? I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to test your faith. He says this after the Isaac episode, but it's unconditional in God's faithfulness to his people. I'm going to do this with these people. That they're going to they're preserve on the earth everlasting. And so it's kind of a both end here. Now from the family of Abraham comes Israel, the Jews. And they get enslaved in Egypt for many, many years. And then, this is what's so great, God comes to Moses and God, it says, I remember my covenant with Abraham. And I have seen their suffering I have heard their sorrow and I'm coming down to liberate them. And he brings them out of a place of slavery into the wilderness in preparation for the promised land. And there he gives another covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. So go to the next book in your Bible. This is Exodus. We'll go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19 is, is where they, God establishes this covenant, this 10 commandments, more commandments about justice, um, about mercy, about reconciliation, um, how to treat people. And here he gives a conditional covenant. Chapter 19, verse 4. It says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel, Moses. And so then Moses kind of unpacks all that God's calling them to do. Flip a couple chapters over. Chapter 24 now. You get to chapter 24, and we'll start in verse 3. So now the covenant is explained to these people. What does God require? How do we act? Now, now notice this. The covenant does not make them God's people. You see that? God's already called them out of Egypt, already saved them. And now he says, okay, now that you've saved, been brought out of Egypt, I'm going to show you the covenant. The covenant is like the family values. This is what should shape you as a people. This is how you're distinct as a people. In verse three, after hearing all of that, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. There's that picture of marriage, the vows. God has made his vows. And in response, the people who hear his vows say, we will do it. Just picture those three words. We will do it. We will be faithful to this covenant. And this covenant is conditional. Look down at verse seven. Then, the book, then, then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, that's intense. I don't know if anyone sprinkled you with blood when you got married. Didn't happen for me. This is to talk about the seriousness of what they're stepping into. Remember, a covenant is to bring two families into one. And it's a, it's a blood covenant. It's bringing you into a family. So this is a family of vows, a family issue. You can't just divide a family. That's a bloody thing. 
And so the blood of the covenant, whenever you would establish a covenant in these days, there was an animal sacrifice that would happen. And so there are a lot of different examples of treaties that would happen between kings and servants in which the, you know, the, the, the superior would basically set some terms of the covenant and what they would do, they'd offer lands or protections or provisions. And then the inferior, the vassal would then say, okay, well, well, I will honor you. I will be loyal to you. I'll give you tribute to you. And they would enter a covenant with a sacrifice. And this is the serious part where basically the, the, the two in, who are entering the covenant would say this, I vow to be faithful to my end of the covenant. And if I'm not, you can do to me what we have done to these animals. You can tear, you tear me apart. And then the other person would, would then vow and say, I will be faithful to my end of the covenant. And if I'm unfaithful to uphold my end of the covenant, you can do to me what we have done to these animals. And you would step into this serious covenant. Now, how did Israel do? They did as well as we would have done. Let's just be honest, okay? No better, no worse. They broke it. And so God shows them the seriousness of this covenant in Leviticus of what they're stepping into. So go to another book, next book over, Leviticus chapter 26. And this is the conditional part of if you're faithful, if you're not faithful, part of this covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. Chapter 26, verse three. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give your rains in their season and the land shall yield its increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And then he starts talking about how the land will actually produce all of this goodness. But if they're unfaithful to the covenant, the first act of discipline is withholding reins. And that's just to get their attention. It's like a, it's like a good parent that says, okay, if you're not going to listen to my voice, I'm going to discipline you gently at first so that you would come to your senses and that you would follow me again. But then he unpacks it even more. He says, but if, if you don't, again, well, then I am going to send more discipline and more discipline until finally you're exiled, until you're removed from the land, until you're removed from the place that I have prepared for you, removed from the place in which you enjoy my presence. Leviticus 26, verse 11. The whole point of this is that God desires to make his dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and I'll be your God, and you shall be my people. But if you will not listen, in verse 14, if you will not listen to me, and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, and if your soul abhors my rules, so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I'll do this to you. And so it's a conditional covenant. If you do this, this is the blessings. If you don't, these are the disciplines all the way to the point in which I remove you from the land because your heart is so hard and you will not listen to me. And they get to the place where the Assyrians come in, the Babylonians come in, first take the Northern kingdom, next take the Southern kingdom. And they're living in exile as covenant breakers. And while they're living in exile, they're wondering this, will God still be faithful to the covenant he made with Abraham. Will he be faithful still to what he told father Abraham that he will not abandon us, that he'll bring a rescuer from us, that will bless all the nations through us? Or is he done with us? And the prophets are sent to tell them of a new day coming, of a new covenant that will be established, a better covenant Something that's not rooted in their faithfulness, but in his. So go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. This is what was found in the book of Hebrews chapter eight. It was quoting here, Jeremiah 31, 31. God says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though, it, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Like God views these covenants like marriage vows. Though I was their husband, they broke the covenant. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with them in the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. One day, I will make a new covenant with my rebellious people, a better covenant. It's established on better promises. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to this Jewish Christian audience saying, Jesus is it. The thing you've been longing for, hoping for, wanting is Jesus's covenant. When Jesus sits with his disciples on the night he's betrayed, and takes a cup from the Passover table. And he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. And all those who are marked by my blood will live in the new covenant for it washes away your sins. This is what he's talking about. This is the work that only God could do. So let's look at why this covenant is greater. So back to Hebrews with a bit of the puzzle put together. Now we're looking for relevance. Back in Hebrews chapter eight, We'll start in verse 10, or sorry, in verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. If the first covenant that God gave through Moses as the mediator was perfect, could bring about perfection, there'd be no need for another one to look for another one. But he says the first covenant had faults to it. The idea of limitations. Now, do we look at this and say, well, God put this first covenant in action, thinking this was going to work, and then saw the response going, oh man, we have a problem. We're going to have to band-aid this thing with a new covenant. Is that what's going on here? No. When God gives the first covenant through Moses, it's intentionally deficient to bring about perfection so that it would intentionally reveal our deficiencies and need for perfection. Do you see that? The covenant he gives is intentionally limited, intentionally deficient to bring about perfection so that it would awaken in us and acknowledge, we would acknowledge within us our need for something greater than us to bring about perfection. And so this is the fulfillment of what has been promised, that Jesus will bring about what Jeremiah prophesied, what Ezekiel spoke about, a new heart, that God would put his own spirit within us and cause us to move and act and want to do what's right. And so it's enacted on better promises. The first is this, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. The first thing is I'm gonna actually make them able to have faithfulness. I'm gonna give them faith in mind and heart. One of the big problems with Israel, one of the big problems with us is we know what we're supposed to do with no desire in our heart to do it. And so Israel got themselves in a lot of trouble often because they were going through the religious practices of the day. They'd go to the temple worship. They'd make the right sacrifices. And God would say, oh, they drive me crazy because you show up and intellectually do all the right things but in your heart is still filled with desire and wrongdoing. And then you leave these places of worship and you go abuse the poor. You go cheat your neighbor. And so I'm so tired of this disconnection between head and heart. And so I'm going to take my laws and not put them on a tablet of stone and make them legal. I'm going to make them spiritual. I'm going to give you the spirit of God living in you. I'm going to write them on your mind and your heart so that you'll know what is right and you'll desire to do what's right. Isn't this what we want all of our kids to grow up in? It's not just do the right thing, but desire to do the right thing, perhaps even with a good attitude, you know? It's like, I just need you to go upstairs and put your clothes away. And they grab their clothes, they're like, oh, put my clothes away. And they're like marching upstairs. You're like, do it with a good attitude, please. Like, I don't really care if you're just gonna do functionally all the right things. I want it to be in your DNA, 
to love to do the right things. And that's our problem is we don't long to do the right things, the things of God. And so God says, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. A better covenant, I'm gonna put this into your DNA. I'm gonna put this into who you are, who you're wired to be. So you'll know it and you'll love to do it. That's totally different than the first covenant. That's real faith. The second piece, which is so good here, verse 11, and they shall not teach one another or teach one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. In the old covenant, there were a few people that knew God. This word knowing is intimacy. It's about relationship. Like Moses knew God, spoke with him face to face. Abraham, Sarah, they probably knew God. But most of Israel didn't. And even after the generations of seeing God's wonders and his power and his signs, those generations were told about God. Let me tell you that you can know about God, but they didn't know God personally. And so God said, I'm going to put my laws and my spirit within you in this new covenant so that everyone from the greatest in the community to the lowest in the community, that both men and women, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, everybody is going to know me not just about me, but have relationship with me. This is an incredible promise of friendship that God has with each one of us, that he's gonna put his spirit in us in such a way so that he would call us friends, every single one of us. What an incredible covenant that we don't have to just wait for the greatest in the community to have a relationship with God and see if there's anything that trickles down to us, is that each one of us will know God personally. So the first one is this better promise of faith and then friendship. This last one right here, look at verse 12. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I'll remember their sins no more. Real forgiveness. The author of Hebrews has been pointing this out the whole time. Like the the blood of bulls and goats could never remove sin. You couldn't really actually be forgiven. You could be atoned for, sin could be covered up for a time. But Jesus Christ in the covenant is gonna do something radically different. He's going to remove our sins, remove our wrongdoings and iniquities. He's gonna separate them from us so that we can be perfected in Jesus. That's an incredible promise of real, true forgiveness that Jesus brings in the new covenant established in his blood. And so then in verse 13, it says, in speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. Like, why would you go back to that? It didn't work. It was deficient. It can't make anyone perfect. Here's the fulfillment of what the prophets were looking for. Cling to Jesus now. Receive the new covenant. And what is becoming obsolete, the author says, and growing old is ready to vanish away. It doesn't last. It wasn't intended to last. It was a signpost of what God was ultimately doing. Now remember, the author is writing to a Jewish Christian community. And what he's encouraging them to do is don't, don't, don't drift from your faith. Don't wander. Don't be dull in hearing so that you don't cling to what God is doing now and go back to the old covenant, but receive Jesus Christ. See, this is, this is actually the same predicament that our wonderful brothers and sisters who are Jewish today need, is they need to realize that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised rescuer, of the Holy Scriptures. This is what Paul says to a church in Corinth. Corinthians chapter three, this is the predicament right now. Chapter three, verse 12. Paul says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. This beautiful covenant that he had. But their minds were hardened For to this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. That when the Lord reveals to you that the new covenant is here, the one that Jeremiah promised, 
then the veil is removed. And you see the Lord. You see the work of the Lord. And Paul says, in beholding him, not only are you have faith, not only do you have friendship, not only do you have forgiveness, but beholding him, you have transformation. You're changed from the person you were to being conformed to the image of Jesus, from being an old, angry curmudgeon to this gentle, generous, peaceful, loving individual. Like Christ is changing those who are under the covenant. He's transforming us to be like his son. And so those who cling to the old covenant, covenant can never really find the forgiveness and can never really find the transformation that only this covenant promises. Here's the last piece of this new covenant and why it's so good. Remember when he gave this conditional covenant to Moses and the people, and he said, this is what you're responsible for. This is what the rules of the covenant are. What did they say? We will do it. But what is the new covenant rooted in? Is God himself saying, I will. You see, the faithfulness of the covenant that's so good in Jesus is not rooted in the we will. We're going to make it happen. When God says, I will. I, I will do this. I will put this in your hearts and on your minds. I will have you know me. And I will forgive you, for I know that you cannot. This is the beauty of the new covenant, is established in the work of Jesus Christ that only he could do. It's in his faithfulness. And so Jesus came in the covenant, and he said, okay, here's the deal. If I'm unfaithful to you, well, then you can tear me apart. You can do to me what we've done to these animals. But God would never be unfaithful. But then it's as though he came in the flesh as man and said, if you are unfaithful, you can do to me what we've done to these animals. And Jesus stood in our place and we tore him apart. And it's through his blood, his sacrificial work, by which we are saved, truly forgiven and transformed. Now, what does, this, what does this mean for us? I don't know if there's anyone in this room who's still holding on to the old covenant as the hopes of making them perfect. Well, I think this is our application. Is that our world is filled with covenants and have, re, have, have acquired for themselves priests of the covenants, so to speak, of how to mediate relationships between people even that you need to say these things and do these things in order to be right with people. And if you don't say these things or do these things correctly, well, then we have to remove you. And there's no space for forgiveness anymore. Do you feel like that? So you just look at the culture, the society that we're living in. I feel like there was a spirit of forgiveness that used to happen amongst us, that someone who was confronted with their wrongdoing could then come publicly and say, I, I see what I've done, and would you forgive me for that? And then we would offer forgiveness to that person. But that day seems to be over. Now, I think it's over probably for good reason. The younger generation, I think, gets this. If you're under the age of 25, you're, you probably get this better than others. Is what the world got weary of were people asking for forgiveness with no accountability. And so it just became lip service, didn't it? So they would acknowledge their wrongs, but they wouldn't change. They would keep doing it. Why would you forgive someone who keeps hurting you, who doesn't actually reconcile things with you, who doesn't confront themselves and say, I'm actually going to go fix what I've done. And so they say, well, I'm not going to forgive you anymore. You don't take your wrongs seriously. And there's no accountability for it. I'm not sure I understand. I don't either, Siri. <laughs> and that's my point. 
is the world doesn't understand. Oh man, that's so good. And so they've used their only other instrument, which is we recognize, we're now willing to recognize wrongdoing. I think for a season it was like, there's no such thing as right and wrong. You do you. That doesn't work anymore, does it? And so this new generation is saying, hey, there's a seriousness to your wrongdoing. There's a seriousness to our wrongdoing. There's seriousness to wrongdoing that's been done in history. And it has to be held accountable. We have to be held accountable. But the only instrument is this. In order to remove the wrong, you have to simultaneously remove the wrongdoer. It's the only one. It's the only way. You have to wash them away. And so I, I want to tell you, the world is craving what only Jesus offers is to not minimize, to not excuse, to not ignore wrongdoing. These wrongs have serious consequences. I deserve death for the things that I've done. And so God pours out his wrath on the wrongdoings of humanity that Christ took to the cross and never excuses them. And then calls Christians who have been forgiven to even go and be people of reconciliation. I think of someone like Zacchaeus who's like, he got it. When Christ came to him, he says, okay, Jesus, here's the deal. I'm going to give half of what I own to the poor and then I'm going to pay back four times anyone I've offended. Jesus is like, oh man, salvation came to this house. Salvation came and showed up here. And you can see the laws of God on mind and heart, a new covenant. Zacchaeus gets it. But at the same time, it's the only covenant that will bring justice to what's wrong and still preserve the wrongdoer. It's the only one. It's the only one that will keep the one who has done the wrong if they confess it to Jesus. And then, and then transform you so that you would look more like Jesus. That's the blood of the covenant. Do you sense, as I sense, our world is hungry for that? You have the answer, friend. We should become really well-versed in covenant language. The The world's craving it. And you can sit with friends and family and coworkers and say, I get it. I see the wrong. It should not be excused. But in order to preserve anyone in this world, anyone in this world, there's only one solution, is that God would deal with both of our wrongdoings and simultaneously preserve us by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's the only covenant that works. It's the only one. Because it is rooted not in we will do this, but in God's faithfulness of I will. I will. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for my friends in this room. I love them. I love them. Father, I pray that we would be covenant people that understand what has been done for us that we would not minimize or excuse our own wrongdoings, our own sin, but that we'd bring them to Christ to be forgiven, that he'd be merciful and forgive us fully. And then, Father, as you give us your spirit to put your laws on our mind and our hearts, that we would not only know, but then we would long to do what's right. And that we would do it with you that you would be our friend, that we would know you. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would allow this incredible news to be funneled through men and women in this room, young and old, into their communities where they're about to be sent back out to. That they would take the great news of a better covenant rooted in better promises in Jesus Christ's death to the world. And then Lord, would you reconcile? Would you do it? Would you reconcile people back to one another? Uh, People with you, God? Would you reconcile people back to God? Um, Through the mediator, Jesus. 
Father, we trust you in this work. It's not ours, it's, it's your work. But help us to be ambassadors of a kingdom in which the glorious Son, Jesus Christ, is the mediator in majesty and in ministry. And so we commit ourselves and our church and our community to you that you would bring about this transformational change that Christ died for. It's in his name we pray this. Amen.